So when I started this channel, my the reason I started this channel, I wanted to get to know wonderful fiber artists from all over the world. And the ultimate dream, as I told all my friends, was that maybe one day I'll get big enough to invite Kate Fawcett to my channel. I don't know if I'm big enough, but dreams do come true for all you cynics and all your people who don't believe in that. Just manifest your dreams and maybe it's going to happen. So Kate, welcome to my channel. It's a privilege to have you here. Lovely to be here. <laughs> People think about you, it's been like 50 years or more of like really different, diverse projects. Tell me how it started. Like, when did you become an artist? Were you born an artist? That's an interesting question. Um, I, Since I was an early child, as far back as I can remember, I always loved color and beautiful things you know i saw the world through the eyes of somebody who wants to see beauty you know so uh i, I was always very enthusiastic about everything around me and um i used to draw and paint from a very early age so i guess i i was sort of born that way you know and your family was also full of artists, right? Yeah, that's right. Yes. My mother was a frustrated artist, you know. And that was the age when you women were not allowed, you know, to to be expressive unless you were very, very, very strong and you bucked all the conventions. Uh like her 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 grandmother, uh great grandmother, was um uh of an amazing painter. Um and 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 really very good. Studied with a, a student of of Cezanne and so forth. So you know, and she went to Europe and she painted, you know, and she was very very colorful woman. So uh, my mother could have, but but you know, she put her energy into raising five children. She wanted nine, but she settled for five. And she, uh, uh, you know. But she also had the vision of building this amazing restaurant in California in a place that was very wild. You know, there was no electricity, just one road that went through the country. And so it was very, very wild place. And they built this world class restaurant and the world came to visit us, which was extraordinary, you know, to grow up as like a country boy, country be bumpkin really but with the most amazing artists and colorful people arriving on the terrace of the restaurant you know to see this amazing place which became very famous you were in big sur right that's right in big sur yeah yeah on the coast of california well so those artists did they inspire you to try to become an artist yes definitely i mean wonderful you know role models you know, the people I met were fantastic, uh, larger than life characters, full of energy and uh, confidence, you know, uh, and, you know, and this was America in the 50s, you could imagine, you know, which was very straight, you know, there was a definite dress code, you know, you did things like everyone else did or else. And all these people were just doing their own thing. They were just being completely creative. So that was a wonderful example. I realized, oh, I don't have to, you know, put on the, the uniform colors of the school, which was kind of beige and boring. You know, I could I could be colorful. I wore orange trousers and a bright pink shirt. And, you know, I was very, very crazy dresser and 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 wore my hair like the beatles and this was years before the beatles even were born <laughs> you know, so so it was i was um i was quite a character in my local school and then you decided to go into the art as a profession right you even got the scholarship to boston uh, fine art yes exactly Exactly. Yes, that was, I mean, that was a shock, you know, because I was, I don't know, I just, I, to me, education was just kind of an abstract thing that happened for other people. 
And so when I went along to this big art school, very professional art school attached to a big museum in the East, because this was Boston, as opposed to California, where, you know, in California, you figure, well, everybody's kind of a health nut, and we're 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 a different group of people from the 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 the, the, the East. See oh. much more like England, you know, they, they were going to be very proper people, grown up people, mm-hmm. and so you know, to go there to this big museum school and go in and take this test and come out with a scholarship was amazing. Um, that that was very shocking. So at, so anyway, I, w- I only went for a few months to that school, even though I had the scholarship. It was a four-year course. Right. And I thought, I can teach myself. I just went home and and decided to draw and paint and make my own life. Have you ever wanted to be a movie star? Yes. <laughs> I, had, I had great ambitions to be an actor i went i went to a, a, a drama school for a little while a little a summer school and um i loved it and um it was uh the idea of being uh, on a stage and acting was very exciting to me you know being larger than life but after a while i realized that that painting was something that I could go home and do quietly by myself, and uh, I could express myself. I could I could talk to the world through art, and I didn't really need to be on the stage. So I didn't. And also, I didn't like the people in the industry. I went down to Hollywood for a while and was going to take a, a film test, and it scared me because I, I didn't. I thought the people are all strange. They're into something that's different from me. It wasn't the kind of people I wanted to be around. Right. So how did the decision to go to England happen? Well, I met Christopher Isherwood, you know, who was then thought to be one of the greatest writers in the English language. And he had written this book, which the cabaret is based on. That's what most people know him for. And um, he, he was, again, very English, very mature amazing mind but he had a twinkle you know he had he was full of life and i met him at a dinner party and we never stopped talking through the whole dinner party we just like it was as if everybody else just disappeared and the two of us just talked and talked and talked about everything in the world about color and drama and literature and beautiful things you know and so I thought I want to go. I want so I, the next day I went and got every book I could that he had written that was I could find, and I read them all. And I thought I, I've got to go to England and see where he came from. And so that was a big motivation for me going to England. Well, it's further than East Coast, and the life is totally different, and people are totally different. Was it welcoming? How was it to be? Well, it was very strange. I mean, I, I, I. I was very nervous and and I asked people, what is England like? And they said, oh, it's awful. The food is terrible and the weather is even worse. You know, it's a dreadful place. And I kept thinking, oh, really? And then I asked this one English woman, I said, what is it like where you come from? She said, oh, she said, people complain about the weather, but I think it's like a pearly light. And I thought that was so beautiful. I love that. Anyway, when I got to England, I found so many people that had a great sense of humor. First of all, they thought America was very, very funny. And that was great, you know, to have this wonderful humor. And um, I just got it. I mean, I was supposed to be on a little vacation for a month or two, Mm -hmm. and I ended up staying all these years. You know, I just, I thought this is home. I love this place and it's close to Europe. So I love that. I loved it being on the other side of the world. Well, I, I saw you mentioning that like what you love most about England, what speaks to your heart is like all those little seaside towns. Do you think it's like it brings California back into your life? Like this is what connects you. 
Not really, because the seaside towns in England are so funky and so um, they have their own aesthetic, you know, little pastel huts on the beach. And, uh, you know, there's something kind of, I don't know, it's, 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 it's kind of naive and sweet and childlike. Uh, and it, it's not my childhood, because my childhood, the beach was wild, you know, it was the great big surf and, you know, the, and the surfer boys and everything. It was a very different feeling for the beach. Um, but I, I loved in, in English towns. I mean, I loved so much. What I loved is the old world and that people did, respected history and old things. And you could create something based on an old tapestry or an old painting or an old aesthetic of architecture or something. And people would know what you were talking about. There was a kind of language of beautiful things from the past, which were respected. And I really liked that. That, 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 that was a big motivation more, even more. But even though my latest book of patchwork is called Quilts by the Sea, and it's all based on um, mm -hmm. wonderful uh, it's little seaside town of Hastings, you know, and we found the most beautiful backgrounds for our quilts in that town. But anyway. I love your story of how you learn how to knit. Could you share it with our viewers? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, it. first of all, I... I, I, I was led to believe that the only colors in yarn were very basic, you know, kind of dark brown and black and gray, you know, lots of gray. There were gray sweaters for the little children at school and everything. God forbid anybody should have anything that had any life to it or brightness. You know, everything was. And, and then, you know, I get to this mill and I find the most beautiful colors I've ever seen in my life. I mean, like old tapestry colors and colors of the landscape. They were the most Shetland yarns that were just exquisite. And so I bought 20 balls of yarn and I got on this train and I'm thinking, I've got to have a beautiful sweater made. How am I going to direct someone she won't knit fast enough. I hadn't met her, but I knew she was hopeless, you know. I, and and I, I and so I thought, I've got to, I've got to knit myself. I've got to learn how to do it, and I've got to put these colors together in my own way. So I just said to this woman sitting across from me, "Do you know how to knit?" And she said, "Yes." And I said, "I've got a pair of needles and some yarn. Could you show me how?" And she showed me how. It took me twenty minutes to learn. And then I practiced all the way to London. I wasn't very good ever, you know, for years. I was, I, I didn't care, you know, I, I would knit very badly, but I, at least I could put colors together and I could see what they looked like on a knitted surface. And so that, that was the thing about knitting for me. It was, it was a way of expressing color. And so it was, uh, I remember once, I, I had the idea of making a little border on a sweater and then the rest of it would just be beige. And I almost went insane knitting that because it was so boring. <laughs> I don't know how people knit in one color. You don't know where you've been. There's no progression. You know, with a motif, you're moving from the middle to the end and then you go start again and you repeat. and all this, but there's nothing to fasten to when you're just knitting in one color. So I, I, I never did that again. Did you knit fast enough for your own liking? I got faster. I, you know, for 35, 40 years, I did nothing but knit. I was just crazy. You know, I, I, I couldn't put it down. It was meant to be just playing around just to see what those colors would look like. But it turned out that I I just was completely grabbed by this thing and my painting just kind of took a back seat and I became more and more um, into the knitting. And, and then I went back to my painting in a different way because I learned so much about color through knitting. 
because I was always putting colors together and seeing what worked and what didn't work and try this and try another little swatch, you know? So it was, um, it was a great time. Well, um, like I heard the story of your very first sweater ending up in Vogue magazine. Yeah. And to me, this is mind boggling because I know so many designers that saying, well, I'm not good enough to submit my designs to magazine. And you go with the very first sweater that you make and showing it to them, and they very excited about that. Tell me the story. Yeah, but see, that, that was another thing that fascinated me about England, was how many people were would never show off something that they had made. You know, I'm, I'm a cocky American, you know. <laughs> what the hell? I've made something fabulous here. I'm going to go out and show it off. And so I took that very first sweater down to Vogue and just put it on the desk. It was terribly made. You know, it had ends hanging out and everything. But the woman that looked at it, the editor, she looked at it and she said, this is where knitting is going in the future. This is something real that I'm looking at. She said, I'm excited. Go home and knit something in Fair Isle. And my the first sweater was all stripes because I didn't know how to do Fair Isle. I didn't even know what Fair Isle was. <laughs> and so I went home and I said to my cleaning lady, do you know what this thing called Fair Isle is? And she said, oh, yes. And I said, how do you do it? And she showed me. That was another 20-minute class where I learned how to do Fair Isle. And, so, uh, and then once I had that, then I could do something that wasn't just strips of color. I could do rhythms of color and repetitions and patterns. And pattern became obsessive to me. I, I went around the world looking at architecture, looking at tiles, looking at China, looking at anything, road signs, whatever. It would turn into a knitting pattern for me. And I could see, oh, there's a diagonal stripe. There's a whatever. And I would just start to knit these things. So when you see, when you travel and you see that stop sign that you did the yeah. whole sweater with that design, do you sketch it? How do you remember all the things that you see? Uh, at first, I would like sketches. I had big sketchbooks and I would just draw and draw and, and, and do take a little watercolor set and go into museums and paint Chinese dragons and you know, things, I would just spend hours, you know, studying the old world for patterns, Scandinavian things, you know, the Scandinavians had wonderful old knitting patterns. There was one I did called Foolish Virgin, which was the wonderful Bible story of the Foolish Virgins, you know, and uh, it, all these things were just there to be had. I mean, that was the other thing, is that I was so amazed that other people weren't taking advantage of the history of pattern that was in our museums and in our travels everywhere, you know, were ideas. So it wasn't difficult to uh, just grab those. And But after a while, I didn't need to make a sketch. I would say, oh, there's another example of a diagonal stripe, but this time it has a flower on the end of it, or it has this or it has that. And I had this kind of mind that I would remember how a pattern went. I actually was like fascinated with your mind because I've watched one video where you were at convention for quilts and yeah. you were tech talking about those quilts and you like off the top of your head, you were like, and this quilt was on the cover of this uh, book and this quilt, I got the fabric from over there and this was the inspiration for this. And I was like, how does he remember all of this? Because you wrote multiple books, like there are numerous yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's difficult to remember words. And I was hopeless at, you know, remembering my lines when I was trying to be an actor. But I have a very visual memory. You know, if I've seen something like that coat sitting behind you, that's beautiful. I mean, I I've, I realize it's, it's peacock feathers. And, you know, so it's, you know, it's in my head uh, as a structure. Um, and that's the thing is that you look at things and you realize, ah, that's another example of so-and-so. Because most patterns are based on really old things that are, there's another variation of it. They're just variations of something. And it's very easy after a while to analyze a pattern and a structure. 
and well, what fascinates me is the fact that you've been productive in many different spheres right not not just uh, knitting but quilting mosaics painting yeah. and they all different mm. is it hard but but then also there is like some your unique aesthetics right so like if you look at the picture from your book from the 80s or from the book now they might be different in fashion and construction but like there is certain aesthetics that goes throughout these years is yeah. it difficult to like reinvent yourself but stay true to yourself Yes, because it's all a quest for color. For to me, patterns are structures that you hang color on. That that color is a very powerful force, but it has to be. It doesn't have to be, but it. If you kind of train it into a certain shape, it's more exciting, and it's, it it becomes more uh, important to people. Uh, if you let it just be any old thing and lots and lots of color and any old color, uh, it, it, it ends up passing people by because it's, there's too much going on. You have to organize color and kind of restrain it in a way in order to make it more palatable or more uh, full of its own potential to bring out the beauty in blue or red by different shades. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, uh, the size of a motif is very important. So it's just, you know, all of that's a very, very interesting study for me. Um, and that, so all the things I do, mosaic, I design pottery, I design uh, lots of, you know, wallpapers. I've done lots and lots of different things. It's all playing with color and pattern and trying to make color more vivid. There's this book about Michelangelo called The Agony and the Ecstasy. Mm -hmm. I can imagine you being the first textile artist alive and having the one man show at Victoria and Albert, Albert Museum must be one of those ecstatic moments, one of those high moments. And I wanna talk about it in a bit. But was there ever an agony? Like, is there an agony of being Kate Fawcett? Uh, the, the agonizing moments in my life is when people have doubted me and had doubted, you know, like, I love books. And my first thought when I think of a new idea or I learn something new is to make a book about it you know let's let's sit down and make lots of pages and lots of so let's explain what it is i'm experiencing i'm experiencing ecstasy here and i want to give that to the audience uh i want to show them what's in my mind and what's making me happy mm -hmm. and so um i love books and i love uh films and i love television and i love all visual things like that but um sometimes in the in the publishing world they would start to say to me oh you're repeating yourself you're doing the same thing again and, um and then they would start to say no no we can't do that because of so and so and they would start telling me i couldn't have you know big double page spreads or i couldn't do the kind of impact i wanted in a book I couldn't use the color strongly enough and so on. Because they were trying to impose their taste on me and they thought I had gone overboard. And it took a long time before I was able to show them, well, my books sell. There's a there's an audience out there that wants what I'm talking about and they want it in the way that I'm talking about it. They don't want it in your way. They don't want a neat little publication, you know, um, and so it was it was very difficult. Those were hard moments when when uh, the team around me started to doubt whether I could do it or not. And then after a while, you know, you just you just say, well, just look at the figures, look at what books are selling. You know, look at, you know, there is something in this. I'm not I don't want to brag, but I don't want to be all uh, apologetic and and try to do things your way because I don't like the way you're describing it. 
it's it's watered down. I don't want to water myself down. Continuing on that same uh, frustration, yeah, I know so many designers that like I would they would show me design. I do a lot of test knitting. This is just something I love doing, and I love seeing how the designers' mind work and seeing these patterns before it hits the market. And often I would say I would get a pattern for a shawl, and it would use. Yep skeins of yarn and I would say you know this shawl would be spectacular if you added another skein like just make it bigger and they would say mm -hmm. no 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 because a lot of people can afford two skeins but not three skeins so I'm cutting the market by like third right and yeah, then yeah. I'm looking at your Chinese rose coat and I was like just curious because I, I looked in Ravelry and it uses for my size it uses 35 balls of yarn and I calculated that if I use suggested yarn, it's going to cost just in yarn over $525, I believe. Mm -hmm. Does, is that part of that agony that you have to do what you feel like doing and not what's going to sell? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I, I mean, sometimes, you know, when I uh, when I first started to knit, they said, one day you'll be designing for the Missonis, you know, like they're the biggest, fabulous group, family of knitters in Italy. And, you you know, one day you will arrive at that. Well, the very first thing I had in Vogue, I got a telephone call from, hello, we are the Missonis. We want to come and see your work. You know, we love what you're doing. And it was like, it happened so fast. But anyway, one day he said to me, I have this machine and it makes Rochelle knitting, which is you take a lot of colors and you put them in and you make this wonderful ribbony knitting. It was very sort of 1930s kind of like knitting, it sort of fancy stitches. And it, I love the idea of that. So I went down and I designed something and I just used about 25 colors and I gave it. And when they put it on the machines they brought me down to the company to to look at, at, at the factory floor and here was this huge machine and they had to have uh, a, a cone of yarn for every color that I had put so they were all lined up repeated and so it was like hundreds and hundreds of cones of yarn to make this one thing it was the most extravagant piece of knitting they had ever produced in the factory. You know, it was like, it was crazy. And I had no idea. If I had known it was going to be that complicated, I wouldn't have used that much. But because I did, it turned out to be the most incredibly beautiful piece of knitting. Um, and they made a very big reputation on making this gorgeous knitting. So sometimes you have to be a little bit... Um, extravagant i think with your design and then you can sort of cut things back if you have to if it's just too extravagant i like to be practical to a certain extent i don't want to break the bank right. but on the other hand i don't want to be held back either back in the like early 80s you started collaborating with ron tell yeah. me how that started how did that happen well um I'm, I saw this, I went to a little f fair. I had a, a, a week long class and they brought a little fair of, of things to sell to us students. Um, and I went to this fair and there was this man selling chenille. And I went up and I said, this is beautiful chenille. I love chenille, um, but it's white. And I said, you know, do you, do you, do you, does it come in colors? And this little man looked across and he said, well, Mr. Facet, I was surprised you knew my name. He said, if you uh, would tell me what colors to make for this yarn, I'll do it. And I said, how do you know who I am? And, and why do you, why would you listen to me if I told you what colors? And he said, because I've heard you speak. And you're inspired, and I I would listen to your sense of color. Well, I went home and I just I got twenty colors out, and I sent them up to the mill, and they did all the colors, and they were beautiful. 
we did we had a, a beautiful run but then i stopped using chenille because it's difficult to knit with but um that just started my relationship with rowan because that was the head of rowan Stephen shared and then he said let's do other things we'll make kits of of wool and cotton and silk and all sorts so we did we did wonderful kids how did this relationship progress and how did it grow since then well the, the way it grew is that um i i i i he, i had the idea that i wanted to do a, a jacket that was lots of different colors but i was going to keep it very doable by people who weren't used to fair Isle. so i made it just two colors a row but very complicated, all diamonds of different colors. And um, I, uh, I, I took the idea to a magazine um, called Woman and Home. And I said, if you would do this as one of your kits in the magazine, I'm sure it will be a great success for all of us and it will be fun. Well, in those days, a success was thought to be if you sold a hundred kits of something, you were a blockbuster you know you had done the, the most amazing thing in the world you had the biggest sales anyway she the, the the woman put it on the cover of the magazine this little jacket we did called super triangle jacket and it was very nice kind of english colors it wasn't too wild it was kind of grays and pastels and lovely tones anyway we sold 7,500 kits and in two weeks. And so it was the most runaway blockbuster success that anyone had ever seen. And the magazine didn't keep any money. They kept, they gave all the money to Rowan and me. And so that was fabulous. So that, that really made Rowan really sit up and take notice of what I was doing. And we started, you know, doing very extravagant knits for the magazine that they were doing. When I'm looking at your designs, you like in your books or in your interviews, you often say that you making it like easy for the knitters to make, that it's more about color than about difficulty of the pattern. Yes, yes. Yet like when you talk to knitters, to the average knitter, and they hear the word intarja, they just close their eyes and run screaming. How do you convince yeah. knitters to give a go to your designs, to to try these techniques? Well, that's part of the agony that goes <laughs> against the thing, let me tell you. Uh, because, you know, I, I was so, uh, you know, when, when I first started to do my book called Glorious Knitting, uh, Stephen said to me, oh, what a pity. Knitting has peaked. It's, you know, it's it's all the popularity is going, you've got it. <laughs> Well, you know, that book put me on the map and it put Rowan on the map because um, I was going to use a lot of different yarn companies and none of the other yarn companies were interested, um, but Rowan was. And so, you know, we've just always had a good, good relationship. Yeah. So then there was like a, this, lots of people were trying knitting and was wonderful it was exciting and they were doing my big coats and they were doing my big shawls and everything mm -hmm. but then that sort of faded away a bit and then the next generation came up all these young people started to knit again mm -hmm. but they were afraid of hell of, of mixing colors and they wouldn't do it and the, the only way they would mix colors if a yarn was all different colors that was given to them and then they would just knit you know the space dyed yarn and so it was as we got back to square one where people were afraid to knit with things but and that i found very sad if they weren't afraid to knit fancy stitches and you know bobbles and all kinds of things which i find very hard I, you know i i don't like to follow instructions with um numbers and knit into the back of the stitch and all of this stuff you know uh i i don't like that i like just one simple technique and then let the color do the work well, so, when, I'm, when i'm thinking like you mentioned at the beginning that you were inspired by shetland wool and the colors yes. of it when i think about like fair isle meeting 
that I saw Shetlanders make, it almost looks like pastel painting because they mix the colors. They like they so gradually change, and then there is this whole um, difference between the contrast between the colors. But so, it, it it's like it looks like a painting, and you always talk about painting with wool. Yes. How do you decide on colors? Like, do you do you paint first and then do the knitting? Um, what, what, color is just one of those lifelong studies. You know, when if I look out the window and I see a woman walk by in a pink coat and she's got maybe a, a green handbag, I think, ah, that's interesting. Pink and green, that looks good in that proportion. So I'll remember that. And um, I'll try that with my knitting. Um, and when I go to the theater or I, or I watch a film or I watch television, I'm looking all the time at, you know, like it was very difficult when, when everybody was starving in Africa, you know, which they often are, um, unfortunately, but the clothes that women wear, you know, those amazing, fabulous patterns and faded colors and things of, of the old, wonderful African clothes. I would be looking at the patterns and the colors all the time. So everywhere I go, I'm always studying um, what what the colors and patterns of that culture are and, and, and um, trying to put that into my work. So it's just, and so you, you, you and and I experiment a lot. You can see from the piece hanging behind me that I'm I'm. This is just all my little swatches of knitting sewn together, and I've done thirty five of these big patchworks of knitting. I want to have a show of those one day, if a museum is out there listening. <laughs> you know, because it, it could be it could be wonderful, and and it's also it it shows you how you develop a pattern a, a structure and try it big and try it small and try it medium size and then try it with dark colors and light colors and contrast colors and so forth. Well, when you look at those swatches, I mean, it's almost like a diary of your artistic career, right? Because some of them are knitting, some of them for quilts. Yeah. When you think about it and looking back at it, how did you change as an artist? How did you change as a person over these years? Well, um, you know, I when I was a painter, I painted still lives. So I would find a wonderful English teapot and I would put it on an Indian cloth or an old patchwork quilt or something. And I would do a painting of that. Um, and and so, you know, little by little, my my concentration became more about structures and the structures that I would find when I would go to the Scandinavian countries and I would go into their museums and look at the old embroidery and the old paintings and the old archa you know the, the way they would paint a church you know paint roses around the altar and things you know or um all of those things that you know that just so I guess my, my what changed was that I began to be just fascinated with how you could make a structure in knitting and then after a while, I realized I don't have to stick to knitting. I can paint fabric and get that printed. And then I can make patchwork quilts with all of these prints. And so uh, it took the same kind of excitement about pattern, but moving it into things that were more complicated uh, that you could do with a, a print, a printed fabric. And so, you know, a lot of my work is, is patchwork now, but it's all textile. I realized I didn't really want to move away from textiles. I, I found my true love. Describe me your day, like, because I can't even imagine you writing books, you teaching classes, you are about to start on the American tour this fall and go through place to place. You travel a lot, you're doing this interview and you're designing on top of it mm. how do you balance it all and when do you find time to do all of this and also like as a part of this question 
there is this pressure of being productive. There is a pressure of putting new design and new design and being on time and doing all of that. The, mm. Do you feel like that takes part, like part from your creativity, from being able to just explore and do what you want? Well, first of all, when you get as obsessed by textiles as I am, you get fast at it or else you know, it's <laughs> like, you know, you're, I'm doing it all the time. I love doing it. It's, it's no problem to sit down and knit some big problem. And now if it doesn't work, I, you know, like I just was knitting something for Rowan. I did the whole back of a sweater. I looked at it. I thought, I don't really like this. It would be better if I made the motifs a little bit smaller and more organized and so forth. So I started again. Well, in the old days, I wouldn't have done that. I would have been, you know, oh, this is precious. You know, I've made it. So it's, we're going to stick to it. I'm going to make it work. But so I, I really, I realized that I love making and constructing and so forth. So I'm very fast. I mean, I can sit down, get it done and try the next one, try the next version of it. And so um, that's, part of the thing that makes it possible to do all the stuff that I do. But the other thing is, um, it's all kind of related a bit, the, you know, the lectures, the books that I make, the travels that I do, it all feeds into my production. And uh, so it's, it's no problem. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 in a way, I feel like I have quite a restrained life because I'm not out playing basketball or, you know, taking my big yacht onto the Mediterranean or, you know, spending a lot of people spend a lot of energy having fun, you know, and I, I to me, the fun is in my studio, arranging my colors. That's that what, what really turns me on and gets me excited and motivated and uh, keeps me healthy and and young well one of the things i appreciate about ron is the variety of yarns they produce yeah and it's also like each yarn has its story it's traceable it's they they care about uh the yarns being sustainable do you ever feel like there is not enough yarn in ron's collection do you are you satisfied with no, me? Not, not at all. Not at all. Because um, I'm only interested in the ranges that have a range of color. Uh, you know, a lot of the yarn uh, satisfies young girls who want to look like old women, you know, dressed in beige and gray, you know. And I don't understand that. I don't understand um, this kind of fear of putting on a a happy color that's going to lift you you know so um i i i i, I find that difficult to uh, understand so i go for I, when i look through the yarns i think oh which has a big nice range of color which has lovely pinks and reds and to go with the neutrals i want i like the neutrals but i want lots of other colors to go with them so um of course, I love the Kid Silk Haze with all those amazing colors. And 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 the uh, felted tweed I use all the time. I'm incredibly happy with that because, first of all, I did a lot of those colors. I brought in the brighter palette to go with the more sort of neutral colors. And so it, it makes it very uh, exciting. You've got a lot of exciting yarns behind your head. I love color. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Do you find Rowan to be supportive to the designers? You know, I get my funny way with them. I mean, I, I there there have been frustrating times when I've designed something quite elaborate and, and exciting, I think, with a lot of colors in it. And I've given it to them. And I've also given them a very simple little stripe and they pick the simple little stripe and forget the complicated design. So that's very sad for me because I like to see people wear uh, clothes that are that not exactly extrovert, 
but that show people's personality. I mean, I'm always hoping that if if I do a design, somebody will take it and they will do it in their own colors or they will do it uh, in the shape that pleases them. They don't have to stick to the shape that I've done it in. I, and th often that's happened. You know, people will take and they'll make a smaller shape or a more fitted shape or whatever. And that's lo lovely. I love to see that. But um, I don't know. I, th I think that uh, I, I've, I feel that I find my audience and that likes what I do and uh, Rowan every now and then has me do a whole collection of flowery outfits or whatever so that it is we come back to that kind of more personality in the knitting. So there is a rose named after you. Yes. Tell me the story of that rose. Well, this was the most fabulous thing that's ever happened to me. To have somebody go to the trouble of naming a rose after me was amazing. And that was Brandon, my partner, who, who went out and found this company that did roses and um, sponsored, really, them to, to, to create this rose. And it's a beautiful rose. You know, it starts out quite a deep, rich color, and then it opens up into this lovely blushing pink tone which is very nice and uh it, it comes again and again and again in our garden so that, you know once you picked it you know suddenly it springs up again which is lovely tell me about your love of gardens because you have flowers throughout your life and your artwork yes yes well that's it i mean the flower is one of God's best inventions, you know, it's just one of those extraordinary magical things, this beautiful, delicate thing full of lovely scent and beautiful colors and fragileness. And, oh, it's just amazing. And it's amazing. Every spring I'm sitting there thinking, I can't believe it. It's not forgotten how to do it. And here's these flowering trees and flowering gardens and, you know, during lockdown, one of the most extraordinary things is Brandon and I would just take a walk every evening, our hour out of the house, out of lockdown. And we would just walk around, look at people's gardens and just the gardens became so intensely beautiful. So um, that is a thing about things that grow. It's, it's, it's a magic act to me uh and i wonder at it every time i see a beautiful flowering plant and you have a lot of uh fruits and vegetables in your collection as well so it's not just flowers right well, they are also very beautiful um I, I i began to realize you know when i went to the chelsea flower show to begin with i began to realize that the parts where they would have all the fruits and vegetables on display was what attracted me more than anything, you know, like the old farmer's markets kind of um, look. And that that just so beautiful. And, you know, to sit down and do a needlepoint of an apple or an artichoke, it's just magic. Or a cabbage, which is like a huge green rose, you know, absolutely beautiful. Well, I want to ask you about Needlepoint, because you mentioned that you don't do computers, you're not a technology guy. How do you create those charts for the Needlepoint? How do you go about Needlepoint? I'll let somebody else do it. <laughs> what I do is I draw out the design on a piece of paper first, and then I trace that onto my canvas, and then I just start to stitch. And I look at a painting or something as I'm, I'm stitching. So I'm getting the shape and everything right. And then I let them, uh, you know, the, in the company of Ermin, where they make the kits, they will record where every stitch goes and they make this chart right. and then they print it properly. Um, in the old days, I would just paint a painting and I would send it to them. And what came back was so terrible. You know, so I said, all right, I'll show you how to stitch it. And I stitch every single one. And I love doing that. I, there's something very satisfying about stitching out a beautiful rose or a cabbage. 
Well, do you feel like you ever gonna slow down? No, <laughs> no, I want to die in the saddle. You know, uh, it's it's it, it. I can't. I think if you made me retire, put a gun to my head and said you have to slow down, you have to retire, I would die the next day. You know, that would be me finished. Uh, it, it's my lifeblood. It keeps me going. Absolutely. What's in the plans? Like, let's talk about your plans for this year, upcoming events. Like, what are you planning? For uh, well, I have a lovely event happening. If, if anybody likes to travel, and I love to travel, Stockholm is one of the most beautiful Scandinavian cities in Sweden. And we're having an exhibition in a wonderful museum there. And it, they're going, it's the same museum that was at the Fashion and Textile Museum in Bermondsey, but they're adding a whole extra part uh, for me, letting me decorate two big rooms, a dining room and a, and a big sitting room with my needle points and fabrics and, and knitting throws over chairs and things. It's going to be wonderful. Um, so that I think anybody who's interested in color and pattern and beautiful old cities i mean and gorgeous food i mean you know stockholm is one of the great cities of the world i think and it's i just love it so um i'm i'm looking forward that's going to be in september will be that show people can look up the details on my website you know to find out so that's one thing that's happening uh what else is happening um oh um i'm working on a um a new book uh and if this um yeah the the uh, quilts by the sea has just come out and and uh, we're working on the next one then uh in wales there's a big exhibition of mine in a castle called powers castle and we put our needle points and knitting and patchworks all through the castle mixed with their antiques and their old tapestries and things so it's very very exciting to be in that company, you know, to have the new world join the old world. Well, I want to mention also this book that I was reading, uh, Welcome oh. Home. And yeah. I was looking, I mean, first of all, it, it's just such a joy to just like flip through the pages and see all different corners of your home. Tell mm -hmm. me how you go about decorating your home, because I feel like this is almost a living museum and you actually had parts of your home travel through museums throughout the world so yes yeah, true it's true uh I, I, there's a book after that called k facet in the studio which really shows uh behind the scenes at at home that looks like this one <laughs> but that that is really you know it has that that's one of my knitted um uh patchworks uh before it's sewn together but the um that shows, you know, my painting studio and my textile storage places and, and all the different aspects of, of what happens in the studio. And that's fun. And I, I can decorate rooms to make them look the way they should for something. One of the things I would like to mention is um, that I knit for Peruvian Connection, which is a wonderful company in um, Peru. Have you ever seen their catalog? No, they, no. they they do a beautiful catalog and they they are wonderful knitters and if i do something in 27 colors or something they don't get phased they sit down and they knit it beautifully in beautiful cottons and in wool and so on and uh, alpaca and so um it's very nice having uh something in the fashion world that's ready to wear that people can buy because a lot of people would like to have my things, but they, they don't want to knit them. They don't want to get the trouble of knitting all those patterns. How do you go about pricing that? Because to me, like this is a, it, it's a piece of art. It's like, it's impossible. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, their prices are not cheap, but they're, they're more realistic um, in a sense. I mean, when I, when I knit something as a special, uh, for a customer it's it's not cheap either it, you know it's it's very expensive i remember once i knitted this sweater 
and it was in a, it came out in a magazine and this woman called me up and she said i've just seen your sweater in the in the new york times or the london times or whatever and i said oh yeah and and she said there's a there's a an error in the writing and i said what she said the price and i said oh no it's supposed to be 275 pounds for this kit to knit this sweater and she said that's what it says <laughs> And she said, I'm just appalled that anything can be so expensive. And I thought, well, you just don't know the value of, of a well-made piece. But anyway. But let's talk about that a little bit. Like, how, yeah. do, you, how do you go about creating the your yarn collection, your yarn stash? How, how does that happen? Where do you buy yarn? Well, in the early days, you know, it started with those yarns from Scotland. And then, you know, I would just go out to yarn shops and I would just whenever I saw an interesting color I would just buy some and I remember this one woman in a yarn shop she said uh those yarns you're picking out sir she said are those for your mother because <laughs> they don't go together and I said don't worry about it <laughs> I'm gonna do something interesting with these yarns myself but anyway um uh yeah it, it, i would just collect yarns everywhere and that's how i built up a stash and uh and i would go and i would buy old weaving yarns in the early days you know things that were really rough and would just take your skin right off you know <laughs> i i would make these big coats and things because it was cheap i could buy the end of weaving yarns and things like that from carpet companies well, you mentioned but, in one of your books that you don't worry about dye lots matching and if you run out of yarn, it's not a big deal. And I feel like that's very empowering because a lot of people think like for every new project, you need to buy new yarn, but we all have some like leftover yarn and some little yeah. bits and bobs of like in our stash. So and you how would I get to know whether another yarn is the same dye lot or whatever, you know, uh, all that stuff. Um, it's 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 just uh yeah not to worry you know and you know in the old days that all that those kind of rules that i had which were very loose you know the people that got it really loved it because just like you said you know you you could use up your stash you could you could just have fun with whatever you had you didn't have to worry about it um but there people are more circumspect now I think I, I I think in a way though I feel like another creative energy is going to come along that people are going to get bored just knitting with one color and and they're going to decide you know we could do something much more fun with this you know I could do something that's a real party piece you know uh, I don't have to just knit another little gray sweater or a little beige number I could knit something that's going to make people really sit up when they see me. You know, if I ever had a gift of immortality to give to anybody, it would be you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Color gives it to me as much as I can possibly have it, I think. You know, it's there's something wonderful about um, uh, just making being able to go to my studio and create and play with color every single day is a great extravagance it's just very very uh, happy making well i want to thank you so very much for being a guest of my channel for spending this hour with me and sharing your story i can't tell you how much it means to me it's like you really made not only my day but i feel like this whole year I'm well, very how lovely. Grateful. That's very sweet. And, you know, I could tell by the the questions you were asking you, that you had done your homework, <laughs> you, that you've absorbed uh, my message as, as far as it goes. I've which been is a lovely. long time fan of yours, so it was <laughs> easy for me yeah, to... Yeah, I can see that. That's lovely. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you for being my guest. Mm -hmm.